water is a global resource, but it's also a very local resource. And so we have to look at it sort of in both dimensions, that it's a global problem set. So water scarcity is a significant issue. Less than 1% of the world's water is fresh and accessible. People project that we're going to have a 40% water shortfall in the next decade. Yet in many places, we have either an abundance or a scarcity of water. So these water issues, while global in their manifestation, have to be very locally treated. So whether you're dealing it from a municipality, wastewater, or producing fresh water for a municipality, if you're in an agricultural business, or if you're in the industrial sector, you have to think differently about water. I would say that the water industry and the water question is in transition. Folks are thinking deeply about water and its relationship to not only resource scarcity or abundance, but also water's relationship to societal stability. So this connection, I think, is being focused on appropriately and, and significantly. The World Economic Forum has highlighted water scarcity as the single most important risk facing the planet. And it's transitioned from not just an environmental problem, but a societal problem because of these relationships to resources and stability. And I would say finally that while focused, people are focused on, on water as a, as a problem, therefore an opportunity, it's an area where innovation, new ideas are slow to bloom because of the kinetics of the industry, how long it takes people to make decisions to buy, the risk aversion, to try new technologies, and ultimately the fragmentation of the regulatory process. The frustrating but real legacy dynamics of the water industry, especially in the U.S., is fragmentation. So there's some 45,000 different regulatory bodies in the U.S., federal, state, county, local, all with the, the, the mission to, to make sure that, that we deal with water safely for their constituents. That makes it very difficult to navigate and think about making decisions. Compare that to Israel or Singapore, where there's a single PUB in Singapore and Mecca wrote uh, in Israel. And there, they can make national decisions. And, and it's, it's emblematic of the fact that those two nations are water starved from the outset. So they had to figure out how to make water a, a, an accessible resource. So this relationship between infrastructure and policy and the way that we deal with regulation is quite important. Often folks don't, and companies, don't change their behavior until they're forced to. So there is a strong regulatory driver. Um, and for us, it's, it's the biggest driver for adoption of new technologies. I think the water sector generally is a regulatory driven sector. So I don't think the risk is that, that regulations privatizes or makes public. So I don't think it's a shift in that sense. I think what I'm seeing is a much more intimate connection between the private and the public. Um, looking for infrastructure solutions, private public financings is a model around build on operate where you have a municipality that in the past would have bought and operated their own plant. They're realizing it doesn't make good sense. So they're going to work with the private sector player to provide that solution. But the regulatory drivers around what you have to treat, the pricing of that, of that water to the customer and the resource base that's generated is key. And in, in, in the industrial sector for us in China and India, the big reasons we've moved to those two countries is number one is they got huge population growth, number two, rapid industrialization, but they've had that. The third driver is they now have a regulatory driver where they realize that the environmental damage that they're doing and the lack of fresh water is, is, is a real health and economic growth issue. So they now have regulations that says you've got to clean up your act. Yeah, I think getting societies to think differently about water is a challenge. Uh, water is a, is, is a priceless asset in the sense that it's invaluable. We can't live without it, but it's also kind of without price. We haven't figured out how to price water relative to the value of the water. So many of the decisions about reuse sit inside pricing. If, if I can get fresh water that's not been repurposed from the toilet at the same price I can get you know, toilet repurposed water, I'm going to make a, a choice in that regard. Um, some of it's marketing. So again, in Singapore, they talk about purple pipes. So you you got to think about how you position the capability. There's an awareness and ultimately it's going to take real scarcity. If it's the only way to do things, uh, then people will adopt it. If you're thirsty enough, you'll, you'll certainly drink almost anything. I hopefully don't get to that, stand, that place. But you can also think differently about having two pipes into the home. So we have the single pipe into most homes in America that go both to your, to your tap and to your toilet. So the simple answer would be reuse toilet water in the toilet, 
plenty, plenty good and, and have you know, a, potentially a different water coming in to your tap. So I think it takes creative positioning and narrative. It's going to take urgency. It's going to take pricing solutions. And I think just thinking differently about how we manage those issues. I would say finally that if you look at Israel and Singapore, two countries that have really had to embrace water independence, their reuse rates are, are in the 90 percent. If you look at the U.S. and the rest of the world, low teens in the single digits. So a huge dichotomy, but we have two great examples in Singapore and Israel what's, what's possible with reusing water. So I think if you can start to create a little more of a strong drive on the demand side through price, you start to create a slightly less tortured path from innovation out into the, into the marketplace. Another thing we need is, is great entrepreneurs. It's a difficult space to entrepreneur, and we're starting to see second, third cycle entrepreneurs in the clean tech space. Lots of good movements around supporting clean tech innovations. Capital is still fairly scarce. And the, on the private side, venture capital, while really excited about the clean tech sector in the 04 to 07, 08 timeframe, is, is definitely a, a not in favor um, sector right now. Government's doing its part, but you're seeing now with COP21 happening in Paris, and you have you know, nearly 200 leaders of countries around the world are making commitments, they're bringing ideas, but one of the big drivers is there's the Group of 28 with Mission Innovation. These countries are going to double down on their R&D budgets. It's going to provide some new ideas. It's good. It's not enough. You're also seeing Bill Gates, Mark Zuckerberg, uh, and others who are committing their private resources, saying we believe there's got to be new ways of investing in these long cycle developments. So I think you're seeing good ideas, but the path is still challenged.